family life and generational wealth was totally destroyed. African Americans are commonly told to pull up your bootstraps and forget about slavery. No one tells the Native Americans to forget about the Trail of Tears or reservations. No one tells the Jews to forget about the Holocaust. No one tells the Japanese to forget about Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the concentration camps. But African Americans are told to just pull up their bootstraps and forget that slavery ever happened. And what did African Americans receive for 246 years of slavery and 158 years of oppression and tormentation? What did African Americans receive? What did they receive? Juneteenth federal holiday. All right, all right. Welcome, everybody. This is Tabidi Umoja, and welcome to the Black Health Report. Uh, to, uh, I'm just going to wait for a few more people to come on in. Uh, this is live. We are live uh, here uh, on Facebook and also YouTube. Um, and I do a live every Thursday at 6.30 p.m. And tonight uh, we actually are going to be covering a um, very important topic. Basically, uh, last week we, uh, we dealt with uh, the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey. And um, we had so much information and this is only a 30 minute show. So we weren't able to really get everything in. And so we decided to go ahead and do a part two of what we were talking about. And I'm going to try to try to pick up where we left off. Um, but I'm going to give a few more people a chance to come on in and chime in and just to give you an idea of what we were dealing with, uh, uh, just to give you a recap, uh, last week we, uh, it was Marcus Garvey's birthday, uh, last Thursday, and that was August 17th. And we were honoring him at the same time. We were also, uh, trying to understand what happened to him. You know, um, a lot of times when we see black leaders that have actually rise and then they fall, we just assume they just fail, but we don't see what happened, uh, what things were done outside of our family and what things that were were done inside of our family. Um, and it's sad to say, I do have to acknowledge some of the uh, sellouts and gatekeepers that we've actually uh, have uh, our uh, sabotagers. Um, and so from this lesson, uh, my goal is not to just uh, name the names, you know, but also uh, identify those who actually have done things to destroy us, but uh, realize that the same mentality still exists today. We have gatekeepers today, just like you had in the 1900s, which we're going to be dealing with now. And we see that the same, same situation is going on. The same, um, it's the same method uh, that's always being used. So it's, it's not something that they have to really change the script. They have the same script and we keep on falling for it over and over and over again. And so um, so today I know I'm going to be dealing with some people who uh, uh, in the black community, we honor people, but uh, we don't really look in and read the history about what they actually did. We just look at the imagery and we say, oh, this was a great leader and we put them on our wall and all these things. But we have to actually really look and say, well, uh, did this person do, do something that actually benefit us as a race or did they do things that actually uh, halted our progress. And we, and I will show you some things today where we can actually, uh, make that decision. Okay. Get a few more. Let me see a few more people in here. Let's see my live. All right. We give a few more people a chance to come on in before I really get started. Cause I'm going to be, uh, shedding some really deep information today. And, uh, I'm just hoping that, um, that not only we look at the program, but we actually take heed to it and actually uh, do some things that actually um, we can actually make a difference. Um, and so um, let's see here. Let's see if we got a few more people in here. Uh, so um, let's see here. Okay. All right. All right. All right. So, uh, so yeah, so we're, we're going to go ahead and get going. Uh, and what I'll do is before we, uh, we, yeah, let's go ahead and get going. Um, the, 
the Black Health Report today, we're going to be dealing with the honor, the Honorable Marcus Mazzia Garvey, history, sabotages, and life lessons. We have to learn from things that have actually happened. It's not just identifying the problem, but we have to learn from our problems. The Honorable Garvey, Marcus Garvey. Now, uh, the last meeting that we had, um, when I talked about the sabotage of, of uh, Marcus Garvey, I talked about certain uh, people that were in roles that, that played a role in actually um, um, his demise. And uh, one of the one of the or two of the people that I mentioned was uh, this group called Friends of Negro Freedom. And these two men and we most people know about them because we read about them in black history. For one, it was a Philip Randolph, who we know about as one of the people who helped organize the, uh, the March on Washington with Dr. King. However, we didn't ever look at a lot of us having read the history on Friends of Negro Freedom. These were these were there were two men, actually, Philip uh, a Philip Randolph and also Chandler Owen. And what they did was uh, they start this organization. And when they start this organization, if you read what they were talking about, they were saying it was going to be totally black, not like the NAACP and some of these others that were run by other people. But it was something that we were we were going to do ourselves and everybody kind of bought into it. Uh, um, they um, and so but these two men, uh, they actually led the uh, Garvey must go movement. And with this Garvey must go movement movement. Uh, they actually wrote letters to the secretary of state and the president and all that. And the goal was to get Garvey removed. And um, and so these this was an integral part of, of Garvey being moved. These two particular people, A. Philip Randolph and Chandler Owen. And this was uh, in this particular organization, as I said in our previous podcast, is that this particular organization, Friends of Negro Freedom, they ceased to exist once they got Marcus Garvey convicted. Then they just killed the whole uh, organization because their goal was just to to kill Marcus Garvey and his mission. OK, and if we look here, uh, this was in uh, Friends of Negro Freedom. Uh, this was Black Post. And you can actually see the uh, the reference at the bottom here. FN, uh, FNF, which is Freedom of Negro, um, uh, Negro Freedom, Friends of Negro Freedom, that is. Leaders criticized the UNIA by 1921. They had organized a Garvey must go movement, as I just mentioned before. The campaign, which ironically drew support from many members of the NAACP and the National Urban League. FNF leaders charged that Garvey's organization was corrupt and posed a threat to economic advancement of African Americans. And then in January of 1923, the, um, the FNF sent a public letter to the United States Attorney General, Harry uh, Daugherty, uh, urging his office to prosecute and deport Marcus Garvey. Anyone that's going to the authorities asking to prosecute and deport a black man, a black man is doing that to another black man, is really uh, questionable. Just my opinion. Okay, the, uh, in 1923, prosecution and conviction of Mar Marcus Garvey uh, also ironically sealed the fate of the FNF. As I said, it, they, they ceased to exist after they got rid of Marcus Garvey. So that was their whole purpose. OK, now I'm adding two more people on to this list of gatekeepers who sold Marcus Garvey out. Last week, I talked about Agent 800, which is James Wormley Jones. He was actually the first black FBI informant, and he was assigned to the UNIA and Marcus Garvey. And um, when he joined the, in, uh, the uh, UNIA or he infiltrated the NI, uh, UNIA, uh, he was put in a role of all correspondents coming in and out of the organization. And that was very dangerous. This is why we have to vet people that are joining our organization, because when he joined that particular organization. By him having all of the information coming in and out of that out of that organization, they were able to use him. And actually, that information was used to prosecute uh, Garvey over the mail fraud situation. Well, they got that information from Agent 800, okay? So I add him on the list with uh, A. Philip Randolph and Chandler Owen. Now, the next brother over to the right, uh, some people had a problem with me adding him on there, uh, but I have to be honest. I have to go through his history and find out, did W.D. Du Bois, was he a gatekeeper? Did he actually work against progress of black people? I know that uh, I talked to one of my relatives not so long ago and they were really, a, you know, they kind of uh, uh, had a, you know, had a 
good feeling about Marcus, uh, about uh, W.D. Boyce, excuse me. And one of the things that they said was the fact that later on he went on and, and uh, met with, uh, with Amy Garvey and actually had a change of, of uh, his perspective. Uh, but uh, a lot of times when you do a lot of damage, and I will tell you how much damage I feel he did, it really put uh, black people back almost 100 years. And, and that, that's a bold statement, but I think I can prove it in the receipts that we have in this particular presentation. All right. So let's go ahead and, and keep it moving. Now, um, W.D. Du Bois, he had a problem with with the Honorable uh, Marcus Garvey. Um, you figure Marcus Garvey, a man that uh, that that built one of the largest, the largest organization, black organization and moved uh, more people, uh, more Afri uh, uh, African-Americans than anyone. And that's hands down. Um, and so um, he wasn't the only one. Marcus Garvey wasn't the only one that W.D. Du Bois had a problem with. But remember, I'm going to back up a little bit before I go further in his role in Marcus Garvey's demise. Uh, he also had a problem with Booker T. Washington. And I'm going to go into this another day, but I'm briefly going to say this. I mean, he had a problem with with Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington uh, had uh, the uh, Tuskegee University. He uh, he's he's. Uh, got 2,000 students that he's teaching, industrial skills, things we need. I mean, moving and this brother comes out talking about we are compelled to point out that Mr. Washington's large financial responsibilities have made him dependent on rich, charitable public. And that for this reason, he has for years been compelled to tell not the whole truth, but part of the uh, part of it, which certain powers, interests in America, which appear as the whole truth. So what he's trying to say. Uh, is that uh, Booker T. Washington was accepting donations for even white um, uh, whites that actually want to donate to whatever he was doing. And so uh, W.D. Du Bois was saying, oh, he's being controlled by them because he's doing that. Um, Booker T. Washington said he would he would uh, use the money to be able to fund his university uh, and they were donating, you know. So um, but anyway, that that was uh, the first person he had a problem with. Then uh, when Marcus Garvey comes out, he has a problem with Marcus Garvey. OK, now I'm going to bring you guys to uh, 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 a time that's very important. This is the uh, the 17th president of Liberia and uh, his name is Charles D.B. King. And the relationship that he had with the Honorable Marcus Garvey is not really talked about too much. Now, um, I'm going to quote a book that uh, that I that I got some of this research from. And that was uh, a book uh, written by uh, Tony Martin. And it was called race first. And in this book, he talks about this relationship between Honorable Marcus Garvey and Charles King. Well, first of all, if you know that uh, Liberia was a place where uh, where Africans were supposed to be able to go uh, and be free, a particular African country where we actually can go and actually be free. Uh, now, Honorable Marcus Garvey said that would be a, uh, a prominent place for, for him to go. And actually, the UNI UNIA was very, very strong in Liberia. Okay, very strong in Liberia. Um, now in, and, uh, this book race first, uh, Tony Mark Martin talks about Garvey and this is, this is, uh, him pointing out that before Garvey went to Liberia, he wasn't just going there saying, Oh, I'm going to take over this and that he actually went through the formal, the formal steps. He, uh, he dispatches commissioner Ellie Garcia to Liberia in early 1920s, um, and told him about their intention and to obtain official approval was basically what they were, what they were trying to do. And so, um, and so she informed them of what they were actually going to do. Now, uh, following that, uh, state Edwin, the uh, Secretary of State Edwin Barclay replied for the president, assuring the UN, UNIA every facility legally possible in effectuating in Liberia its industrial agricultural business projects. And so they were actually giving them the green light to come in and actually uh, let's put some things together because remember, Africa is the richest land on this earth. There's all kinds of resources and minerals that are there that could be used. Uh, and they're, they're all they're used already, but they're not used by African people. They're, they're being abused for their land. And anybody that knows about colonialism and neocolonialism, we can see that these African countries are not being able to benefit. We, we talked uh, and before I continue on this, we talked last week about Mali and Niger, when especially Niger, when uh, they're. Uh, supplying um, the um, uranium and the uranium is obviously used for electricity and lighting so we can actually have the the, uh, the resources out however in in Niger 80 percent of the people are in the dark when their resources are going to France and so that that's a problem 
That's a problem. OK, uh, that's like you having a um, a peach tree in your backyard and you're starving, but all the neighbors get a chance to eat. But you can't. You know, it's really scandalous. But anyway, we're going to keep it moving. So Edwin Barclay, uh, he gave he gave Marcus Garvey the green light, too. He said, come on, you know, um, uh, and actually not only him, but it talked about the uh, Dr. Gordon Jordan, excuse me. Um, he was the National Baptist Convention leader, uh, Liberty Hall, and he actually gave him the green light as well. OK. And if you can see the particular resources that are in Liberia, it is the largest rubber producing uh, country in the entire world. And these are the things that Garvey was looking at uh, in reference to um, to trade, because not only was he going to use the star, uh, the the uh, star line uh, uh, for trade back and forth. But at the same time, uh, he was going to put about 20, about twenty five, uh, twenty five thousand exactly families uh, in Liberia to be able to come there and they could have actually been able to reside, help the economy work and the whole bit. Okay. So these are things that he had planned and you can see how this particular tree, this rubber tree is very similar to the maple tree where they actually, um, they actually, uh, carve a hole in the, 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 the tree itself in this, and, and, it, and this pressure causes sap to come out. It creates this white, uh, looks like rubbery type material. And the sad thing about it is they don't make the end product there. You know, they don't make the end product there. It actually goes uh, uh, abroad. OK, so this is a rubber. Uh, and you can see the things that the, the rubber is used for is used for uh, aircraft tires, he heavy truck tires, race car drivers, uh, uh, tires, uh, natural rubber for uh, brakes, air pads, seals. I mean, all kinds of things we yeah. use rubber for. And so. Bring it to bring it to bring it to focus. Now, Marcus Garvey is is trying to get the industrial industrial um, situation going on, but you always got a Judas that's right there, uh, trying to halt your situation, and that's why I say that's where W. D. Du Bois comes in. While he's planning on bringing African uh, and black power to Liberia to be able to uh, to deal with trade and actually. Uh, they could have been the four, four, four runners of the rubber industry. But in January of 1924, W.D. Du Bois accompanied the U.S. state minister, Solomon Porter Hood, and a Firestone rubber expert on a trip to Liberia's rubber lands to, uh, to ascertain whether Firestone should invest in the area. Now, Marcus Garvey's already there, already there doing deals, and you're bringing in Firestone. You're bringing in Harvey Firestone. And then and and I'm going to go into it a little bit later, but you come to find out in 1925, he sought to capitalize on this by asking Harvey Firestone to include blacks amongst his company in a supervisory per, uh, personnel in Liberia. So he's asking Firestone for a job when we had the ability to have a black owned rubber company. See, this is this is why I say he set us back. Why did I say he set us back uh, 99 years? Well, this is what happened. Charles D. Uh, D. B. King, and actually Du Bois was in Charles D. B. King's ear as well, talking about you got to hook up with uh, with Harvey Firestone. It'll be a good idea, and that's what he ended up doing. So Charles D. B. King is also responsible for this ninety nine um, year setback amongst black people. Okay, the ninety nine year lease. So they gave um, Firestone a ninety nine year lease, rubber tire company in Akron, Ohio. Okay. And, um, and so they actually got that deal. They, they, they've got that deal. And then, and what's so wild about this situation is that in, uh, this was actually printed in, uh, W.D. Du Bois's, uh, black sovereignty. And they talk about here, uh, it was reported in June of 1929 that there was an investigation of Liberia by the league of nations, uh, and it soon revealed that indigenous Liberian workers, most likely the crew and Grebel peoples were being cruelly exploited by the America, uh, uh, the America Lib Liberian elite. OK, so um, you 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 got someone else taking over your country. And and, and the, the problem with this is they had these these um, these quotas that they had to make in these fields and they had to get so much. In, and, and actually, there was reports of them working almost 20 hours. And some of these workers have to actually have their children uh, helping out and working. And, I, and to my understanding, some similar situation is going on in the Congo uh, with a whole nother scenario. We'll deal with that at another day. Okay, we're going to keep it moving. Okay, now, um, this is also an Africa First by Tony Martin. 
Okay, he talks about the fact that um, that uh, W. Du Bois uh, he actually had asked that um, that two ships uh, take over the Black Star Line, and uh, he wants the United States uh, government. He wants to know if they can aid in a plan that will furnish at least two ships for the tentative beginning of direct commercial intercourse between Liberia and America. That's exactly what Marcus Garvey was doing. Uh, such intercourse would be directed by a private company composed of blacks and whites. Now, that's a little different than what Gar Garvey was talking about. We was going to do this ourselves. But it's W. Du Bois. He's, he's asking, okay, the Secretary of State, Charles E. Hughes, to, in to include commercial intercourse between um, Liberia and, and America. Such intercourse would be directed by a private company composed of blacks and whites. Okay, so when people talk about Pan-Africanism, we're not doing that, right? The company would take up and hold a trust, the Black Star Line certificates. He wants them to take the Black Star Line certificates and hold them in a trust. This is W.D. Du Bois. Okay, and this is the letter for some people who put in the chat that that's not true. Well, here you go. We have uh, early in the year of 1924, this is a letter that uh, W.D. Du Bois, okay, he wrote uh, the uh, tire company now. He's writing, he's writing actually Harry Fire, uh, Firestone. And just listen to this, this situation. Some would call it um, kind of uh, begging. I, I don't know. We, we'll see it. It says here, early in 1924, this is, this is W. Du Bois speaking. He's talking to uh, Harry uh, Firestone. <clears throat> I was in Liberia. Uh, as a special representative of the president of the United States in inauguration of president King with the, with this, this, you know, extraordinary rank and all of these things. And he goes on at the bottom here. Since that time, I have learned that arrangements have been made by Firestone plantation company for raising rubber on a large scale in Liberia and making other industrial improvements. I am very much interested in this development. Now he showed them where the fields were. He, he connected the deal and they didn't even call him. So now he's calling Firestone. So, yeah, I heard you guys got a deal. And, and this is, you know, and so this is kind of, this is kind of simping really. And then, and then right here, he, he says, uh, African, uh, African and, um, African and Americans have a chance to work up in your industrial system. Okay. They could not expect to begin at the top, but they could begin at the bottom if allowed a chance for promotion. Do you hear this? This is a letter. W. Du Bois is writing Firestone after they got a 99 year deal when he blocked the deal that, uh, or the relationship, the industrial relationship that uh, Marcus Garvey had. Okay. And then it goes on to say, they are going to make unnecessary troubles. He's talking about black people uh, unless they are satisfied from the first that they are going to be treated as men. So he wants them to treat us well, okay? Without any imp, uh, imp, uh, imported color line, okay? They themselves, because of the lack of educational uh, inequalities, cannot furnish much help in the higher parts of your organization, but they can furnish some person uh, and you can secure Negroes of the highest intellect, okay? He's talking about himself and his uh, maybe 11 other buddies, and training in the United States. So we're saying uh, that we got some smart blacks and we can oversee it, right? Okay, so this is his. Okay, now uh, this is another letter that um, W.D. Du Bois wrote to the Honorable Charles, he calls him Honorable, the Charles Hughes, he's the Secretary of State. And, and um, in this particular letter, he says, as an African-American uh, citizen of Negro descent and a member of the executive board of the Pan-African Congress, I am very much alarmed at the ferry of Congress to com uh, confirm to the Liberian loan. I believe it is an open secret that the British and French governments have only been held back in their aggression on Liberian territory. So there, he's kind of playing one against the, against the other, like, uh, yeah, you know, um, Britain and France, they're going to go ahead and, and, and chime in there. Okay. By the interests of the United States and by the prospect of her active aid, if this aid finally fails, I understand that the British banking interests in particular have secured such financial hold in Liberia. I'm going to go ahead to the next page and, and get to the point. Why does he have to bring Marcus Garvey in his letter 
to the Secretary of State. And he's talking about Marcus Garvey now. Now bankrupt Black Star Line. The difficulty with this was uh, uh, was that its leader, Marcus Garvey, was not a businessman and turned out to be a thoroughly impractical visionary, if not a criminal, with grandiose schemes of conquest. Okay, this is W. Du Bois speaking to the authorities. Then go, he goes on to here, it says, American Negroes in commercial enterprise with African, possibly by having a private company headed by men of the highest integrity, both white and colored, to take up and hold in trust the bank, excuse me, the Black Star line certificates, so telling them to hold, to take his uh, Black Star uh, certificates and put them, hold in a trust. Okay, very respectfully yours. This is his letter. Let's keep it moving. Okay, here we talk about, it talks about um, um, the reason why, uh, the, the reason why there was so much apprehension. First of all, Liberia tends to want to work with the UNI and do some really wonderful things. But then, uh, but then all of a sudden, yeah, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, uh, they started having a change of faith. And we have to say, well, what? What what happened? What changed? Well, we're going to figure out what changed. Why did they always? Why did they come down? And first of all, the king and 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 um and Barclay and all of uh, Barclay and all the rest of them were so interested in Liberia working with uh with the UNIA, and then they changed. Well, here's the thing: if you look at the map and you see where Liberia is with that big yellow arrow there at the bottom, and then you see Sierra Leone and also you see Guinea, and you see I'll put an F right next to Guinea because France was actually uh. Uh, co colonialized Guinea, and then you have Sierra Leone, uh, British in British hands, and so they were mainly concerned about how they're going to feel about having the UNIA strong black um, focused group in a country that's close to them, and so this is why they took a stand, and this is where they switched up. It, it talks the fact that uh, initially they had uh, uh, they had offered them. Everything, anything that they wanted. As a matter of fact, uh, they were talking about uh, uh, working on the farms, building buildings, uh, drug stores, all kinds of things. They even met with the cabinet. Everybody's with it. But then one of the concerns they were having is how the British and French companies would, uh, they, they thought that maybe they might refuse coal, uh, coal to uh, black, the black Star Line ships. Okay, that's that's one thing. And then, um, then here's where, where uh, Barclay wrote. Barclay a secretary of state Liberia, he says, Mr. Marcus Garvey's movements and activities are, however, of no practical practical interest uh, to the government as they have not uh, given and will not give endorsement to his fantastic sh uh, schemes. This amazing statement came one year after Barclay's letter of approval to Ellie Garcia and four months after the cabinet, cabinet interview of UNIA. So they just switched up on UNIA and said, we don't want you any, any more here, mainly because they're fear, fearful of the French and the British who are uh, actually colonializing uh, neighboring countries. OK, OK, we go on to look here. And uh, this is what and Marcus Garvey, this is what Marcus Garvey found out that hey, these these fools, they're not going to honor what they said, and he realized that they're selling out on him. So this is where he comes back. He says, Liberia was founded over 100 years ago, he wrote, for the purpose of helping the refugee, slave, and the exiled African to reestablish a foothold in the in his native land. Therefore, no, uh, uh, no Liberian, neither at home nor abroad, has any moral or other right preventing Negroes to return to their home to do the best they can for its development. Ashe. And this is uh this is a book I would like to bring everybody's attention to. Uh, it was written uh, by Tony Martin and um, a very, very, very powerful, powerful book. And it's something that uh, that we all uh, when you get a chance, we all need to go ahead and and uh, and and read uh, this book, Race First by Tony Martin. He has a lot, a lot of good information uh, in that particular book, um, and so uh, it's just a, it's a, it's 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 a sad shame that we had to, uh, we you know we had this situation going on, uh, and you have to say, well, well, what can we do? You know, what what is a, you know, I described the problem, 
but I always want to leave, you know, because we're closing into our 30 minute mark. I, I want to uh, leave with some answers. Well, um, first of all, we have to acknowledge, and some of us don't realize that we built this country. You know how we say that all the time? Well, I'm going to show you like a two minute clip right now. And anytime you get these fools telling you, oh, you, you blacks haven't ever done anything. You're lazy. You, um, uh, why don't you pull up your bootstraps and all these other things? Well, last week I showed you all of the, the towns that they flooded that we, you know, that we had, uh, built, but also this country itself, we built as well. And so, um, let me go ahead and, and, um, and let you check out this short little two minute clip and you'll see all the things we built here. And how we can still build these again, but for ourselves. That's the that's the answer is building these, but built them for ourselves. So we will have these things. Okay. All right. With 246 years of experience from slavery, black skilled labor was desperately needed. The slave master was not building buildings or planting crops. And it is not a lie when African Americans say we built this country. Well, let's see how true that really is. The White House. Slaves owned by White House architects James Hobbin were used to build the White House. The work began in 1792 and took eight years to finish. And after the completion of the White House, Presidents continued to use slaves to maintain the household, and seven presidents even brought their own slaves, including Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Andrew Jackson, and Zachary Taylor. The U.S. Capitol took more than 30 years to build, from 1793 to 1826. Many slaves were actually on the task force. There are records of 385 payments being made to owners of African-American slaves. Harvard Law School was built in 1817. It was funded by Isaac Royal Jr., a slave owner. A lot of his wealth came from African slave working on sugar plantations and farms. Harvard Law School had to admit in 2017 that slave labor was used to build the institution. In 1838, Jesuit priests, who were the founders of Georgetown University, sold 272 slaves and used the money, which is today worth about $3.3 million, to pay off debts and build its campus. To offset the damage, in 2016, the university provided preferential administration to the descendants of slaves who had been sold. From all right. All right. So you can see what we've done when when people say we haven't built anything. We built this country and you can see from uh, from what I just showed you. All right. Uh, so the best thing we can learn from this is that um, we have the skills to build. We have the skills, but we also have to honor um, our people, especially when you see uh, brilliant uh, black uh, people that are actually doing things. All right. So um, um, I appreciate every, everybody who tuned in to my live and make sure that you uh, that you tune in for next week because next show next week, we're going to do herbs for life. OK, that's going to be on August 31st at 630 p.m. And um, I'm going to be covering the uh, 10 common health concerns um, of, the, of our community and then ways that we can deal with them um, naturally. And as I always say, the information that I share when it comes to health is for educational purposes only. If you have any medical questions, you ask a medical doctor. All right. All right. So everybody, hopefully you enjoy the rest of your evening and um, and I will see you next week. One love.